need a Bible. We have a couple of excellent back there on the back if anybody wants to look because uh, I, I do know that sometimes when you see it, it's different because it would see things that, was, that you haven't seen probably maybe differently, uh, I hope. I want to read you some uh, notes. I'm always writing little notes out of thoughts or things that come up in. And, uh, I just have these little notes and pages everywhere. Um, let's see. Let me, let me start with this one right here. The physical body, and you know, this is one of the reasons I did say, pause in just a second, one thing, that it's good to see in the scripture or in your Bible. What I'm saying is because when you see what I'm saying from your own Bible, you can say, oh wow, I didn't I didn't know it meant that when it said that, or I never put that together in that life, in, in that manner, that fashion. And that that's why I, that's why I say it. So the physical body is a divine slash human machine made of atoms and molecules. Beneath the atoms and the molecules is energy. And I'll pause right there and say this. Now, modern biology and science is proving that and saying that exact same thing. That's the physical body that, that really there is an unseen, they call it force. I would prefer to use the word power. And by that I mean if you ever read Dr. Hawkins' book, Power Versus Force, then you would understand what I mean when I would say I wouldn't use force because force is the energy of man and his ego-driven abilities. That's why we call it armed forces. That's enough military power to try to get something done or make people go in that direction. So I never ever use God in association with force myself. I always use in association with power. The reason I do is because the the root behind power is love. And so love is powerful. And so that means it has divine energy essence in it. So that's a, that's just a little pet peeve of mine. And I read a lot of times in, in phenomenal books that I even recommend. And many times they would use the word force talking about the energy of God like it's trying to be like the armed forces, in other words, is trying to manipulate things, and that's what force does. Force tries to manipulate. Power doesn't. It doesn't even have to. But anyway, I highly recommend, if you've never read that book, it's an excellent book, Dr. Hawkins, Power Versus Force. So let me read it on. You said, made a uh, divine human machine made of atoms and molecules. Beneath the atoms and the molecules is energy. God is energy. Energy cannot necessarily be seen. In other words, the life that is actually living through you as you cannot be seen. So you can think about that. The life that's living through you as you cannot be seen. And that's why I say that phrase. It, you know, using Genesis 1.26, God made man not in its image, but as its image. So then man then, if you can understand that and read it in that light, it's whole different if you read it that way because that's how it really is in the, actually the Greek Septuagint take it, had taken and translated it from the Hebrew and should have been said man, God made man as its image. And so when you understand that, you realize man is the visible reflection of who God is. And, you know, does that put man in the status of God? Yes, it does. But it doesn't mean that man contains uh, all of the attributes of all that God is, but it does. he does contain all of the abilities of those attributes. That's hard to say because we would always reduce ourselves to less. We just have that, we have that carnal uh, stuff hammered into us consciously and unconsciously. Purposefully and not purposefully. And so many times we get sidetracked from that. But anyway, the life that is actually living through you as you cannot be seen, your body is moved or 
lives or movement constitutes life. Modern, bi modern biology saved that now. That they realize that now the secret behind life is movement. And the reason they say that, they say that uh, the way they can prove it is that uh, carcass, a dead human being, has all of the things that a living human being has with one exception, and that's movement. That's the only difference is movement. So they're saying movement, in other words, movement is just that. That's called energy or the sine wave. That energy is movement. It can be seen and it cannot be seen. So that's what, that's what life is. It's movement. But it's moved by the unseen energy. We live in an energy universe, not a material universe. Again, biology proving that over and over and over. And of course, the now, now uh, science is beginning to awaken to spiritual truth outside the arena of religion. Hallelujah. <laughs> so religion doesn't put a damper on science that's trying to find the truth. You know, it has for hundreds, even thousands of years, it has put a damper on it. Tried to end it. So, so what's happening, I think, is a phenomenal thing. May not be necessarily for the religious community because it's really shaking it up. People, many people are, just can't buy that anymore. Y'all understand what I'm saying. I mean, it's just, that's just a, a natural phenomenon taking place all over the world. It doesn't just happen right here. It's happening all over the world. People just can't embrace much of the religious garbage. Okay. We live in an energy universe, not a material universe. The field or energy is the sole governing agent of the particle or the physical reality or that thing that we call matter. And I just kind of wrote this and deducted a lot of this from uh, Bruce Lipton's, the, his book, The Biology of Belief. If you have never read that book, that's a phenomenal book. So you ought to, you ought to grab that and read it again. And here's another little note I want to read and get this in your thinking because actually these songs that the ladies sang have to do with the things I want to share, which is a continuation of the things I've been sharing for the last 35 years. <laughs> Most people are taught to think the Bible is a book about heaven or hell. That's how most people are taught to think. It's about heaven or hell. In other words, heaven, heaven being a place that you get to go to. That, that is probably the, the worst definition of heaven that you and I have ever swallowed and accepted. The idea that heaven is some kind of a fall at the end or somewhere and you get to go there and that's where God and Jesus and everybody at and that's where God's building you a mansion or a cat, whichever you get. <laughs> Some people say, hey, I just like to have my cabin in Paris as long as I get to go there. And, and that is such a gross, gross projection of error and we buy that. We think about that. I can't mention the word heaven without... When I say that, immediately you are projected to some kind of an ethereal place in another in another world, or you're you're ejected to the blue sky and call it that. And we do that. We do that constantly. And yet I can show you in the Hebrew that is not at all what the Hebrew word heaven is about, or what it means. In which I will do that in just a minute. I will show you. That. And once you start to see it, if you can look outside your box, he over the edge of your box or step around the corner from your box and for a, just a little bit get out of your box and be open I can remember 25 years ago I was 28, 30 years ago I was coming out of that main charismania charismatic thing that I had spent the first 10, 12 years of my quote Christian life in and I was gun ho in it and I shared that same thing they shared in that charismatic, charismatic movement. And uh, then about 26, 8, 28 years ago, 30 years ago, I started pulling out of that. And I told, I told God, that's my words, I said, okay, God, I'm going to think like that, but now if the devil gets in here and messes me up, it bless God on you. <laughs> it's your fault. And so I opened my mind up and I started thinking, I thought, wow, why couldn't that really be? <coughs> And the more I delved into that and thought of that, I realized that was that was the truth. That is where the truth is. Out of the box, it's 
way up. So most people are taught to think that the Bible is a book about heaven or hell, when in truth, it is a book written over hundreds of years about the temple of God, which is the physical body. As we relearn how to read and understand this ancient mystery, we will again awaken to our true self, which is our God self. Everything that we do not know, this is a bit difficult, so you have to really listen. Everything that we do not know holds the, the miracle for the things that we long for. That's a Lynn Hayes tunnel question. Everything that you don't know holds the miracle for the things that you long for. Everything that you long for right now, peace, happiness, prosperity, <laughs> everything you long for is in the unseen waiting for you to discover. And it's not somewhere else either. It's not somewhere way far, far off. So I'll read this again. Everything that, that we do not know, we don't know, and I'm, I'm going to play on that in a minute. Jesus said this in John, John I think it's John 8, 28. He said, you shall know, that word know is gnosko, and that is an actual intuitive thing. And every one of you have an intuitive nature about you, but most of us from infancy are taught to pay no attention to our intuitive nature. We don't do that anymore because nature itself is intuitive. Okay. Everything that we do not know holds a miracle for the things that we want. In order to find the things we inwardly long for, we must practice the unknown. <laughs> to find the things you inwardly. There's nobody sitting here that don't have a lot of things you're longing for. I don't care who we are. I, I owe everybody inwardly long for things. Many times we don't tell anybody. Many times we do. You know, we can call it goals. You can call it, call it how many of you have dreams? Everybody has dreams, don't you? Or goal? Or something, you know, you, you were in the New Year, 2018. Y'all sure did. God, they've already made you a New Year's resolution. Yeah, you need to. Uh, <laughs> Terry had made it a goal. Already broke it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or even make it if you don't like yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, listen, this is, this is tricky, but I want you to get this. It's very tricky. In order to find the things we inwardly long for, we must practice the unknown. Practicing openness through silence or what's known in Eastern religion or in Eastern traditions is called no mindfulness. That's, that's a term they use. No mindfulness or no mindfulness meditation. So listen to this statement. Practicing openness through silence how many of y'all have ever practiced silence? I know you have here because I, I harp on it a lot. How many of you found that's very difficult? Everybody I know has. Something, something, I just can't do it. <laughs> you can, you just won't. Because what happens with practicing silence, mindfulness, practicing silence is actually practicing tapping into the unknown. Why is it that way? Because the unknown is God. Because it doesn't it say no man knows God. I'm just quoting you the Bible. That's what it says in the book of John. No man. Why? Because God is unknown or in the unknown. And so how do you get into the unknown? You do it through silence. If you study Kabbalah and you can understand what's known as the tree, the tree of life in Kabbalah, or in other words, the ten sephirots, which is the seven stick man, Y'all are all familiar with my stick, man. I'll put him on the board in a minute. But it's practicing that with the three attributes of God. So you have seven and three. The three attributes of God are light, life, and love. You see, it's out of light, which is unseen energy, that everything proceeds, 
In other words, all life forms come from that. From light. So everything that's living, or even everything that is that you think is not living, comes from light. And it's out of the things that living, divine love is the manifestation. That's you and me. Life, life, and love. Those are the three attributes of God. Those are the three top sephirots on the tree of life in Kabbalah. And then the other seven are you. They're the physical body. They are the sevens that run like a thread from Genesis all the way through Revelation. If you ever want to do a study, do a study on seven. It's everywhere. And I'm going to talk about it and show you some things about it. It is heaven. Heaven is the seven yawns are you. You are heaven. And I'll show you. So practicing openness through silence and no mind meditation will carry us into the realm of the unknown. The Bible is a book about the unknown that seeks to be made known. You get that? That's what this marvelous book is about. It's about the unknown. In other words, it, I guess it's about God, but God longs to be known in the scene. But he doesn't. The Bible is a book about the unknown that seeks to be made known. Throughout the Bible, there are dozens, dozens, I, I even wanted to say hundreds of stories I wish that we could go back in our minds and look at it the way it was written from its very infancy. It was written as myths and stories. It was never written as a history to record the movement or migration of a special people. It is not about that. It is about everything in it is about you. Right here today. All the stories are about you. I can take you into story after story after story and show you, you, in that story. And that story is so that you will know you better. And that's one of the things that we lack is to know yourself. I have to get to know me. I can struggle to know you and think I know you and sure enough you'll throw me a curve or you'll walk out of this place or do this or say that and I, well, I didn't even thought, I don't know you that way. You know why? Because we know through judgment. Judgment of things we see, things people do, and we agree or we disagree. Do you know where we get that? We get that out of religion. Of course, we get it from our mom and daddy. <laughs> but they got it from their mom and daddy, which got it from their mom and daddy, which is not anybody's fault except mom and daddy. Go get that. I hope you. So where do you trace mom and daddy back? Infinite. It's just things that have been handed down to us and then religion has done us a tremendous disservice with these stories. They are stories, they're myths, they're allegories. And that's what they're called. Even Jesus called them. Matthew 14, Jesus said that all the characters in the Old Testament were parables. Paul says that they were all allegories. So they're not literal, real characters. So if I'm talking about, if I'm talking about Adam and Eve, I'm not talking about two literal characters where the whole thing started. You know, have you ever heard people that like to argue of what they call deeper things? And they say, well, where did Adam and Eve's three boys go get their wives? Now you went, actually that one. Well, they went down there to another land. Well, what's them girls doing down there in that other land? And where'd they come from? I mean, you know, you got all these unanswered questions if you would just really think about these things. But many times we don't. We don't really get into thinking about it. So throughout the Bible there are dozens and dozens of stories, myths, allegories that are formulas. These stories are formulas or they are codes of the unknown made known. Two stories. Okay. Wow, that was a lot of wood. <laughs> Everybody got that? So if you have your Bible, I want you to get your Bible and I want you to follow with me. Uh, in all of the stories, myths, or allegories, there is a central theme, which is the temple, the sanctuary, the home, the house, which God lives in. And I say this over and over. I don't think I can say it too much, and I 
I pray that we grasp, we grasp hold of it. And that is God did not build a house not to live in. If God built a house not to live in, God's not near as smart as I think He is. So if I'm going to build a house, a mansion, I'm going to live in it. And you are the house. The scripture tells you that. Right? Over and over, doesn't it not? Don't you know that you are the house, the tabernacle of God? So if you will go with me to uh, go with me to Genesis chapter one. I hope that hope we're thinking. Uh, I, I know you are. I know you are thinking. Genesis chapter one. And let me read this. Uh, you can quote it. I know you can all quote it. In the beginning. Uh, that's the Hebrew word barashit in the beginning. It's the Hebrew word barashit. Time, as we know, doesn't have a beginning or doesn't have an end. So to say in the beginning is a misleading phrase. I can say it this way, at your birthing. And that's what the Hebrew word barashit means, at your birthing. At your entry into this physical dimension. Okay? And you can call that your beginning if you like. That's fine. It works, it works fine in that life if you understand it in that life. But this book is a book about the building or birthing or bringing forth or manifesting God's tabernacle, God's house, which you are. So I can say it this way. In the beginning or at your birthing, God created the heavens and the earth. And so I can actually say it this way. And I'll just put this up so that you can follow me through it. And we did it. Last week, but let me just do it quickly again this week. Uh, the Hebrew word heaven, I'll start over here. Sheen, mem. Sheen has a value of 300, mem has a value of 40. And he, in Hebrew, if you study Hebrew, all Hebrew, all Hebrew characters have both an alphabetical and numerical value. Every one of them. So there is there is something separate, like here in English, we have an alphabet, but then we have a numeric system that's separate from our alphabet. In other words, you can't go through the, how many characters are there in the English alphabet? Is it 27 or 28? 26. How many? 26. 26. Okay, in Hebrew there's 22 with an additional final to give it 27. So you can use it both ways, 22 or 27. That's the Hebrew alphabet. There is no numeric system. It's all in the alphabet. So to learn to count in Hebrew is to learn gematria. And gematria is a, is a science where you reduce letters to their lowest common denominator. And in that science, you can begin to do that. And if you understand the first nine glyphs of the Hebrew alphabet and, and its numeric value, then you'll begin to open your mind to a lot of different things. Let me give you a for instance. How many of you are familiar with the story of Abraham and Sarah? Everybody? I'm sure you are. How old was Sarah when she finally got pregnant and she had a baby? Does anybody remember how old she was? No? Ninety. Do you know what the what ninety? Ninety in Hebrew is called the Tasada. But if you count in Hebrew, the way you and I are taught to count in English, then actually 90 would be 18. Now, is it hard for you to think of an 18-year-old girl having a child? No. So now, if you understood that Sarah was only 18 when she had that child, you start to, oh, well, that makes more sense. Because it never made sense to you for a 90-year-old woman to have a baby. <laughs> Hello. No, you come on, be honest. You go, well, yeah, my brother lived back there. It was different. They, they just lived to be three, four, five hundred year old. Boom. No, they didn't. <laughs> and I can show you that. See, when you, when you begin to see and you learn the Hebrew, and you can understand that both the alphabet and the numeric system of counting is profound in itself. It constantly confirms confirms and what it confirms it confirms to your knower the unknown so that now you begin to build your life based off the unknown that now becomes known to you 
That's called intuition. It never will lie to you. It always leads you in the right path. So uh, I just I just want to show you. That's just a little. That's just a little. Uh, I can show you a lot of other different tricks. But see, if I did this, this is the first part of the Hebrew word for heaven. It's called Shem Bim Yodim. The entire word heaven is Shamayim. Okay, but this glyph, Shem Bim Yodim, has a value of, if I add these together, what do I have? 300 and what? 40. 40. If I reduce it to its lowest common denominator, it comes out to be good. Exactly. Now you have to pay attention because seven becomes the most important number as you walk through the entire Bible. Why? Because seven is the number of the tabernacle. It's the number of the house. It's the number of the dwelling place of God. You and I call it the number of perfection. It's also the number of completion because you are the perfect, complete house God lives in. And you were formed when your father's egg, or your father's that would have been something. Wouldn't it? <laughs> your father's seed penetrated your mother's egg, and that double strand DNA was born that is you. That very moment, there were seven little miraculous things happened to you in conception, and you looked like a little bit worse. And that was your endocrine, your endocrine system began to grow from your spinal column. That was what was there. Just a, and from that. You, here you are. Here you and I are. So that's that's the first part of this particular glim. Shin mem, this is the word heaven. Yo, which is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, has a value of 10. And then it's got the final mem, which has a value of 600. Now mem, always in Hebrew, mem, whether it's mem 40 or mem final, 600, Either way, Mim always deals with water. Always. Just like the name Moses in Hebrew is Moshe. The very first glyph to spell the name Moshe, Moses, is, is Mim. And what's Moses' name mean? I, I'm sure all of you have read the stories and you, you even saw the story. What does his name mean? Moses means to be drawn up out of water. See, that's exactly who you are. You are a water vessel drawn up out of water, but the water you've been drawn up of is twofold. It's miraculous. So this, this glyph right here, uh, this, this part is actually referring to rainwater. And rainwater comes from where? Above. There you go. Oh, be above. And this glyph right here, look what the value of this glyph is. 600 and what? 6 and 10 equals what? 610, which equals what? Seven. seven. Ain't this amazing? You have seven, and you have seven. So both ways you look at this, this mem, yod mem, this mem means waters below. Below. Or, I would just say it this way, salt water. Salt water, the waters below, right? Salt water has a chemical makeup that's similar to the makeup of your blood system. So this refers to your blood, okay, in which in your blood is what the scripture says is what? In your blood is what? The life. The life there, okay? And this refers to your lymph node system. Lymph node system. And your lymph node system is all fresh water. Every cell in your body is covered with this, this fresh water. But then your blood, and they don't mix. They don't mix. Your blood doesn't mix in with the other water in your body. They're separate. It's like the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, the tree of gnosis. These are both the same thing. The tree of life, the blood, the tree of gnosis, water. It's the same thing. And yet, what, what are we designed to live? We are designed to live from the knowing not live from the believing. Can you get that? Well, I believe. <laughs> I hear that. That always starts a good argument. Because what you believe, somebody else believes different. But when you come to that point where you live from your knower, from that intuitive gut, what your knower says and my knower says is the same identical thing. There's no division. There's no separation in it. 
Why? Because you're living from the Spirit, the gut of your being. Not just up here the accumulation of what we would call head knowledge. We get stuck in that. So heaven, this is, this is, the, this is the Hebrew word for heaven right here. Shem, Mim, Yod, Mim, Shamayim. Shamayim is a word describing you. So in the very first verse, we have a description of you. It's right out of the starting gate. Right out of the get-go is a picture of you. And you have always projected heaven out yonder somewhere and still do. When you hear the word, every time I'm saying the word, you're projecting it unconsciously out there somewhere. And it's not out there. It's in here. <laughs> Heaven is in here, as Jamie's song and Mary's song so clearly, clearly shows us. Jesus said it, didn't he? Luke, he said, where is the kingdom of God? Most of the people associate the kingdom of God with heaven. Where does Jesus say the kingdom is at? He said, don't go looking for it in the Middle East. He said, look for it inside yourself. That's where you're going to find it. When you're looking for God, you're not to look for God out there. When you're trying to pray for a God that's out yonder somewhere, you're never going to touch it. Why? It's in your own heart. In your own knower. The unknown is known in you. Especially through intuition. Alright. That's just, that's just dealing with the word heaven. Then we come to the next word, which is earth. And it's just as powerful because when you put these two words together, heaven and earth, you realize heaven in me has touched and mingled with the earth as me to make me one unique individual. That's heaven and earth. It's not the glow with the ball, the terra firma that you're standing on, but you think it is. So we don't even get past the first six or eight words in the opening of the Bible until we're already off base because we have learned this book from an English translation through a religious mindset. And I know one of us that had it. I don't care who we are. And so what do we do? That religious mindset taught you things you need to believe by their definition. But it never showed you the things that you can know by your own definition. And nobody can ever live your life for you. And nobody can ever walk in your shoes but you. There are many people who can walk with you. There are many people who have walked through the things you walk through. They can help you. And that's all. They may advise you. They may just cry with you <laughs> or experience with you but that's it I had a fellow years ago who told me was he was he was telling me this is what you have to do with and he, gave, he laid out some rules <laughs> and he lays and all these things and I said well I'm going to tell you what after you have walked in my shoes ask me I will listen to what your advice is otherwise you have nothing to inform me with, period. Especially if you haven't been where I've been. So, anyway. Then we have this word earth. And when we break this word earth <coughs> down, let me spell it up here. Alif. Rash. Alif has a value of 100. Rash. And then you have the final tasada in this word, which... This is, uh, that's, this is the number 900. This is the very last glyph. This has, you remember when I had the 90 over here? This, this draws from the 9. And so when you have these glyphs, 9, 90, and 900, and you can understand geometry, you can begin to realize that in this glyph, this glyph defines the same thing as number 9, which is in, in female energy, that's what number nine is referring to. Female energy, in other words, you and I all have that feminine energy that has the ability to be creating and create. Every chaos that's in your life, you created it. Every bliss that's in your life, you created it. Yeah. <laughs> the both. 
the things you like and the things you don't like. You get to create it. That comes from this number nine. Feminine. When you carry it all the way back to number 900, now it has infinity or it has the source of divine divinity in its ability to produce. Now, if you start to look at this from the last glimpse of this, of this particular word, we call it earth. It's actually in Hebrew, it's aretz or iretz. It's e or a alif. That's the number one. Retz is R or Rash is actually fire. So we get fire. Fire is actually another word for energy. So here you have this number one God. You have this number, the second glyph, 200, referring to fire or energy. And then you have the final Tassada, which has to do with feminine energy. Now it's divine and it has the ability to constantly produce and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. And this got called Earth. And Paul picked up on this in 1 Corinthians. He said, do you not know that you are earthen vessels? But every time you read this word heaven, you read this word earth, your mind goes somewhere else. You can't read either one of them without it doing that. But if you can learn, and I'm trying to help us to learn, to see, to think of the unknown being made known. That's what both of these glyphs are about. They're about you and me being manifested in the physical dimension to see the things that God desires to see through your eyes. Okay, now I want you to go with me to Genesis uh, 2 7. You're out here close, 2 7. And just buckle your seatbelt. This is kind of all introductory, <laughs> Inter introduce you to some things. And uh, while I'm doing that, I want to read you this. Uh, um, this is a phenomenal. If y'all have never read the Emerald Tablets, you can get many, many books that are called the Emerald Tablets and all of them that I've, that I've got, I, I can't remember, I think I've got four, five, or six books that are all titled the Emerald Tablets. But, and, I, and they're all good, but they all approach this from a different angle. You know, like, it, it should not be tablets with an S, it should be tablet, even though there, there is one that talks about the Emerald Tablets and there's, there's 13 tablets or, or phrases in that particular thing. But this one, the Emerald Tablet, is in the British Museum. It was it was discovered, I think, in seven, like 1700s or late 18. I can't remember, but it's in the British Museum. It is a green emerald tablet, and it has inscribed on it. These words, these words are written on the tablet. And they say that this wisdom goes back 36,000 years to Hermes. Trismegistus. Hermes was a, a man god. He was a, he was a character, a mythological character. How many of you saw the movie Thor? Y'all see the movie Thor? Thor was Hermes. In he was called Thor in the movie. He comes from the word Thoth. That was one of Hermes Hermes names. Thoth, Thor, or Hermes. Triceps three times. Megistus manifest. In other words, he's three times manifest. That's what the that's what the story is about. And these these uh, seven phrases have so much depth to them, and a lot of ancient literature is drawn off these. And these are all on that green emerald tablet in the British Museum. The first one is in truth and without deceit, certain and most very. You can think of any one of these infinite. Number two, that which is below corresponds to that which is above. Now I want to show you something. That which is below, we look at that as the earth, corresponds to that which is above. We look out into the astrological sky, stars and moon. Look at it this way. There's a guy on YouTube that's really, really way out. He's really good. His name is Cullen, Cullen Stevens. He's just a young guy, but he, he got a lot of wisdom. Terry, you need to definitely look him up. Stephen Collins. I mean, sometimes he comes on, he don't even have a shirt on. He has real long blonde hair. I mean, real long. It comes, I, it comes way down. And sometimes he'll have it in, in, he'll have it in a little watch and it's sticking out and up and out. And he's got feathers tied in. But when he opens his mouth, listen, I'm telling you, the kid is, I call him a kid. He might be 40 year old, maybe. 
if he's really stretching it, he might be for you. But I mean, it just pours out of it. It just amazes me that these young, young people, you got young, that just coming up out of it this way. It's phenomenal. He's just a, he's just a, a river spewing out of his mouth with profound. Anyway, you Google him sometime, I think. If you can get through him, he's a little right. He's a little uh, unpolished. <laughs> but anyway, look at him. And here's what he says. Now we're talking about this. We talk about Hermes Trismegistus. We're talking about the Emerald Tablets. We're talking about wisdom that is both. We want to reduce it to known, don't we? That's. I mean, I do. That's my whole thing. My my whole thrust is to find the unknown and make it known. Because I know if I can find the unknown, I know I'm looking for the source energy, i.e. God. And if I can make God known in a visible, physical, manifest fashion, people can begin to either see it and resonate with it and or begin to be it themselves. So that's my desire and my goal. But Stephen Cole is talking about as above, so below. What he says, as above the belt, so below the belt. And he gets us some really deep things. But physiologically and psychologically, this is very true. And especially when you start to understand the stick man. Uh, let me just put my stick man up here because I need him on here anyway. Okay. Anyway, 
If y'all haven't read this, I, I mean, to cut to the chase and to skip some time, get the book and read the Emerald Tablet. It, it's just, it's just tr tremendous. It's phenomenal. It's, that's the Emerald Tablet right there. Those these seven phrases. I'm gonna lead you. I'm gonna read you the last two. In this way, in other words, the things he just described. In this way was the universe created. From this comes many wondrous applications because this is the pattern. Therefore am I called thrice greatest Hermes, having all three parts of wisdom of the whole universe. All three parts. Now when he talks about all three parts has to do with his three names. Thought, many people will read about it and know him as Thoth. T-O-T-H. Thought is a short abbreviation for thought. As a man thinketh, so he is. In that is a phenomenal principle of making the unknown known. Okay? Therefore I call, I'm called thrice greatest Hermes, having all three parts of the wisdom of the whole universe. Herein have I completely explained the operation of the sun. S U N. I want to read a lot in that book, but I'll skip that until next week because I need to. I'm pushing on time this morning. I want to get to several things for you guys to see, especially when it comes to association of words and people's names. And the scripture is really big on this association of words and people's names. And I'll show you what I'm talking about when I when I get to this. In Genesis 1, 26, uh, it says, and you don't have to, I'll read it to you. And God said, let us make man. That's the Hebrew word, Adam. Let us make man. That's the Hebrew word, Adam. Adam. Alif, Dalif, Men. That's what that word is. That's called, that word is called man. Okay? Then if you look with me in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 23, real quickly, it says, And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of, and Adam is the word man, it's the same word. Adam and man are the same identical word in most cases. In most cases. In most cases. Not all. Most, I'll show you. It's the word Adam. Well, this word right here, if I take, if I take this off of it and just spell it that way, dalit mem, that's the word for blood. That's the Hebrew word for blood. But if I add this to it, I add the divine nature, now it's the term for Adam or man in most cases. So it's just simply saying that man is the visible manifestation of God. That's who he is. He cannot be. And ain't a thing that he's done is wrong. Even though everybody says, well, that's wrong by whose standard or whose definition. Because by his definition, it could have been right. I know many cases where people said that's wrong when actually it was right. It depends on the circumstance and the situation. <laughs> Alright, look at this. Verse 23. And Adam said, that's this, uh, that's this character right here. Say it. Look at this. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. That word in Hebrew is uh, esha. She shall be called woman. Esha. And the word esha actually means to be the womb of fire. Fire actually means it, it, it bees. <laughs> It means the created word. The created word is fire. It's energy. Do you, do you not realize your words are energy? You can start a fight in a minute. I mean a fiery heated one. <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> with words. It's like what was on Brother Dave Garson. I know what's in every book, in every library, in the whole world. And basically said, well, what's that? Words. <laughs> <laughs> now watch this. He said, I mean, God had taken from man, 
made he woman, and he brought, I'm sorry, verse 23, I was in the wrong verse. And it says, uh, this is now on my bone, flesh of my, she shall be called woman, woman, man, a shock, because she was taken out of man. That word man is not Adam. That word man is esh. Now why didn't, why didn't they change the word there? Because that's not the same as Adam. This word man is esh. Now you know what the word esh means in Hebrew? Ash in Hebrew actually means word on fire or word of fire. Why? Because it's a word that will create. That's why in John, John, in John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the word. Actually, that's an improper translation too because it wasn't referring to a starting point. It was referring to the first point of creativity is the word. It's what you speak. Listen to your words. Pay attention to what you're saying. Make 2018 a year. I'm going to pay attention to what I say. Because you get what you say. If you say it enough, you're going to wind up getting it. Now, that's another illustration where they take an English word man, and now we've got two different Hebrew words that we see right here, and this one is esh. Now, go with me to another place right here. Uh, if you would, Psalms chapter 8. And I'm going to try to do this quickly here and tie this up. And uh, if you have questions or answers, we can try to get to them or comments or what have you. I just want to show you a use of different words. Now, Psalms chapter 8, just this one verse, 4. Psalms chapter 8, verse 4, and it says, what's the first thing it says? What is man? This word man in Hebrew is enosh. This is not the Hebrew word esh. This is not the Hebrew word adam. This word is enosh. Now, if you listen to that word, you will begin to hear something in that word that's translated in Genesis chapter 5. If you will, go back over there with me to five. So now we have Adam, we have Esh, and we have Enosh. All three Hebrew words, tremendously different in value, meaning different things always translated man. Always. Enosh. Now I'm reading from the King James Authorized Version, but I want you to notice the King James Authorized Version is different, it said it'll take one word in one place and say it this way, it'll take another word in another place and say it another way. Right, it just does that. I think the New American Standard don't do that. King James does that notoriously. You know, uh, not, I'm not trying to say it's right or it's wrong. I'm, I'm going to say this up front. Both New American Standard, New English Version, King James Version, all these version, version, versions are all wrong. There are none of them translated accurately from the Hebrew or the Greek. That's the sad synopsis. They're not translated correctly. Now, does that mean that they're corrupt or wicked? I don't say that. I don't even, I don't even want to imply that. I do want to imply that with much diligent research, you can find the truth in any one of them if you're willing to go and do the work. But doing the work, will, it will really pay you the benefits which are huge. Now, I, again, I'm just I'm driving at this, I'm hammering at this, I know I am. Adam, Esh, Enosh. Look at this word right here. Genesis chapter 5, I'll just read several verses. Well, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. That's the, this word right here, Adam. God, this is God-man blood. That's what this word means. God-man blood. Drawing off Leviticus 17. I wanted to go there this morning, but I ain't got time. I will. Maybe the next time. I don't know. Got blood. Dealing with blood. <coughs> the blood deals with these two. Water's above, water's below. Water's above, water's below refers to you. It's called heaven. Wow. 
You are heaven. You try to look at somebody, you're looking right into heaven. And you don't have to go through no party gates to get there. <laughs> This is the book of the generation of Adam in the day that God created man. I know. In his, in, as, as his life. Not in, but as the likeness of God made he him. Wow. The male and female, no division here, created he them, blessed them, and called their, that's him and her, name, what? Adam. Call them both Adam. Her too? You mean her name was Adam? Yes! You said, what, well, brother? Lynn, I thought her name was Eve. No! Adam named the womb man that come from Esha. Adam named her Eve and said she represents the mother of everything living. God did it. Adam did. Just read. It's amazing to me that people have read a story from some kind of a Sunday school lesson that is just a far-fetched thing that has embellished on the biblical stories and got it completely wrong and believed the wrong story as opposed to the truth. <laughs> but boy, we do. And all you got to do is go back and look at it and read. I've heard people ask me questions out of Genesis chapter 3 that I know they got it right out of the seven-day Adventist Sunday school literature. And they don't know that. They don't know that the majority of the Baptists, the Methodists, and the Presbyterians, after uh, Ella G. White began to form, and then her protégés began to form the Seventh-day Adventist Church, drew from a lot of Old Testament truth, but mixed it in with a lot of just religious error. Uh, you know, building on the Sabbath, and not anybody would have a clue which day that would be of the week if that's what you're going to make it. From the Hebrew word Shabbat, the Hebrew word Shabbat actually means peace and freedom. It ain't got nothing to do with the day of the week. If I can understand that this is the Sabbath, the Sabbath yom, if you look, you'll notice the English translation of the Bible has only six yoms in Genesis chapter 1, and the seventh yom is not introduced in the first chapter. It's introduced in the second chapter in the first four verses, and it has everything to do with the combination of yod he vav he to Elohim, which is energy, essence, i.e. God, in a, in a state of Shabbat. And that means peace and freedom. So when you understand the Sabbath is not a special day of the week, it's an attribute, an attitude that you are supposed to maintain all the time of peace and freedom. When you can live in peace and freedom, you are celebrating the Sabbath. And God said, that's what's holy. That's what's holy. Your peace and your freedom. When you get out of your peace and you're over here in turmoil, you can rest assured you're not in the Sabbath. But when you can rest in your peace and freedom, you're in the Sabbath. Okay. Let me read on here real quick. And they called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And he lived and he lived and he lived. Then come down to verse 6. Seth. Seth was Adam and Eve's what? Third son, right? Adam and Eve. Well, it was Adam and Eve's... Seth is Adam and Eve's second son. Eve and... Uh, Eve... And the Lord had uh, a son too. See? That, that's different, isn't it? But that's the truth. Look at it right here, chapter 4. It says in verse 1 And Adam knew Eve, his wife, she conceived and bare Cain. Cain represents the physical body. Okay? And then it says, that's the first one, right? And then it says, I have gotten a man from the Lord, and she married again and had Adam. Where'd she get the first one from? She got the first one from Adam. Who'd she get the second one from? The Lord. Is it called Adam? No, it's called Yodhi Bhavad. It's the soul. So she got the first one from the physical copulation. She got the second one from the soulish mingling with the physical body. Because you see, the soul is divine. 
It's eternal. It, it doesn't die. Your soul will never die, and it ain't your spirit. But your soul carries the information of your physical body. It's built that way. It's designed that way. And then in the last verse of that fourth chapter, the last two verses, they have another, Adam and Eve have an, another son, or second son. Eve has that one with his soul and called, what she called his name, Abel. And you remember what was the story of Abel? Cain did what? So Abel, and you always thought that was the killing of the brother. When in actuality, Abel, as the soul, surrenders itself like in death to the physical body. Even though it has the attribute and the power of God itself in it. But it surrenders itself to the physical body. And all of the chaos and the corruption of the physical body can manifest if it wants to. Or tap into the power of the soul and create bliss on earth. Seth has a son. Watch this now. Most people don't know this. This is a repeat right now starting with verse 6, chapter 5. Verse 6 is a repeat of starting with Genesis chapter 1 going through Genesis 2, 4. In other words, it's 7 again. This number 7. It's talking about the physical body. Yet this time it doesn't call them yawns or days of the week. This time it gives them physical names. And notice the very first one that it gives right here. Verse 6, Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. Do you know what Enos' name is? If you look at it in some translations, yours probably says Enos. Who is Enos? I just showed you over there in Psalms 8, it's man. It's you. It's the physical structure. It's the material manifest body. That's who Enosh is. And right here, now then, the very first son that's being manifest here out of seven, and actually that's what Seth has. Seth had seven sons. In other words, seven yons. Seven endocrine glands. The first one is the planting of the physical body so that it can grow to be the house of God. Whew. Nobody ever told you that. But you can go through and do your own research and your own homework and you'll see that's exactly what this is saying. That's exactly what it's about. So you have the seven sons, E, you have Enosh, you have Canaan, you have Mahalel, you have Jared, you have Enoch, or Enoch, y'all know him as Enoch, you have Methuselah, and you have Lamed. And Lamed is the father of Noah. He brings forth the, the magnifold grace of God. All the stories are about you. Everyone. Everyone from, from the beginning to the end, they're about you. So it doesn't matter the character's name. The story is a story of you and your journey. Hallelujah. Into physical manifestation. Ooh, I'll quit right there. Anybody have any questions? I got a couple of things. Oh, okay. Jump <laughs> in there, Terry. No, I just, uh, um, just like you were talking about the errors in the Bibles, I mean, they're, they're strung, strewn with them throughout all of them. But actually, that was my Savior because when I found those, it yes. set me free. Yes. Because it was supposed to be infallible. And then when I saw them, I was like, this is not infallible. This is a man. <laughs> those errors will be your Savior. Amen. When I realized hell was... Just the grave in most of the verses. Just a pit. <laughs> it pit. wasn't a place. I mean, it just blew my mind because I was like, I've been lied to. <laughs> so those same things that you think are horrible that are keeping man in bondage can also be its release because then you see the truth because there's a lie. There's something wrong there. And when it's blatantly wrong, you know, like if somebody says this fire is not hot and you stick your hand in, of course, if your hand melts off, you realize, oh, he's lying. <laughs> that is uh, blatantly hot. You know, so just wanted to throw that in. And, and one other thing. Uh, we'll just go ahead and come on up here, Terry. You no, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> I like to do that. But um, are y'all, anybody here for me with Alan Watts? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. One yeah. Of my I, I just, I love his, uh, I the dream about what life is all about, I'll just play this for you. That's what our real reality is sleeping so that we can create 
this wonderful playland. Mm -hmm. And the real us is not worried how this ends. It's not worried whether you suffer or whether you have everything in your dream because it knows it will wake up the moment you sleep. Mm -hmm. And then it will do it all over again because that is all there is for it to do forever. As all of us, we're all the same. Whatever it is, whatever the, we call it God, but whatever it is, is powering us all in this dream. And the dream is what we make it because it is, like you said, it's handed it over to a creature that it's created in its dream that can actually dare interact for the creature that's dreaming. I mean, just unbelievable. Unbelievable. If you're not familiar with Alan Watts, he's all over YouTube, so I would really encourage you to look at him, read. He's got a lot of books. I've got a lot of his books. I love him. He's, uh, he was an Episcopalian priest. And then the truth got a hold of him, set him free. And he traveled and he did all, he was studied all religions. I mean, he was uh, real big into Buddhist. He knows all about Christianity, though. He studied them all. It's uh, pretty good stuff. Because he, you know, when he talks about stuff, he'll refer to all the yeah. different religions. He brought a lot of the Eastern religion into America back in his day, late 50s and all during the 60s. I think he died in the mid 70s. He did. He died, I think it was 77, maybe, or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. It was a phenomenal. But that's called the dream. I know you guys couldn't hardly hear it. My phone doesn't have this figure. But so if somebody wanted to look it up, they could just look YouTube. it up on YouTube. The dream. Alan, Alan Watts, Watts the like, like uh, W-A-T-T-S, Watts, um, and look up the dream. And of course, that would give you a lot of other... Oh, absolutely. Time. You'll find he's... Because yeah, he's, that's all he did was give seminars and seminars and seminars. Oh. He's got... Yeah. Uh, he didn't have to let uh, His family, you know... Yeah. I was about to say that he was the head of this home. Huh? I was about to say that he was the head of this home. He was, absolutely. Oh, he was. Yeah, he was a pioneer. Was I'm, a pioneer. In, I'm infatuated with uh, infatuated with waking up. Because even though I, I have a I don't even understand what a fully is. I just want to wake up, you know, up to whatever. But I was telling Jan for the other day, the more I meditate on, the more I think about it, and the more it's not going to be possible for me to fully wake up. Because I think the minute I wake up, Terry, this creature, whatever, I think it wakes up. If I wake up to it, it will wake up and I will be gone. You understand know what I'm saying? There is a separation that I will never in the physical form be able to cross. Because once I do, the true me will wake up. And, but the true me isn't worried about all this stuff. You're talking about Hitler and all this stuff. It's just a, it's just a, it's, it's a game. It really is. But it's glorious. And it's what we do. It's what we do. Bad stuff happens, but that makes great stuff great. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just... Without the contrast, you wouldn't... Absolutely. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, you got the people that were in the Holocaust, but then you got the survivors. Listen to their story. You know, they're heroic survivors. I mean, you always... Just like we're just back in the Bible. The Bible is filled with uh, misinterpretations. But, uh, man, if it wasn't for those lies, I would still be in it. I like y'all.